welcome. So yeah, first I would like to thank the organizer for uh, inviting me and uh, setting up this interesting conference. It's really a pity that uh, half of us cannot be there and I really I would love to be, but yeah, that's, uh, that's life at the moment. Um, so um, also I apologize for those who have probably heard some variant of this talk before. I mean, um, still, I kind of feel very much excited about these results and there are some new points on this result, uh, which I would like to stress. So I will give, uh, and since the time is limited, I also decided that to give a lot rather specialized, specialized topic, which means I will focus on exact results on spectral form factors, not uh, so much about the rest of the stuff that is written on this slide, but it's basically just about the bullet one. Um, so there is this result, which is like three years old now, uh, and on ticked easing model. And then there is a generalization of this result on dual unitary circuits, which is just being published in CMP, which I will also try to cover in the last part of my talk. Of course, uh, this is rather technical stuff, so I will not, uh, I will try not to, 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 to dig into any technicalities, but I try to, to give some main points uh, also on the idea of the proof, but just the main, main, main kind of main, main, main ideas and to, to see why this, I mean, try to, to discuss why this, I believe these things are interesting and maybe we can have some, 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 some follow up, uh, interesting follow up. <clears throat> so, okay, so I would, I have to stress also that two essential collaborators for this work, Dino uh, Bertini and Pavel Kos. And uh, the main motivation is uh, the plot in the middle is, uh, you know, for those of us who have grown up in uh, chaos theory in dynamical systems, uh, we have been always missing uh, exactly solved models of many body chaos and quantum many body chaos, just like we have learned about exactly solved models of single particle quantum chaos, which is this famous Arnold cat. I mean, if you take, open the textbook, then you, they, they, uh, in dynamical systems, then the, one of the first thing you, things you, you learn is that, you know, there is this very simple chaotic dynamic assistance, which can solve exactly in statistical sense, even though it's chaotic. So, I mean, <clears throat> but in many body theory, we are kind of learned, we have learned that, you know, what you can solve is three systems, non-interacting systems, maybe some particular cases of interacting systems, which are called integrable systems, but you, you know, kind of, you, you're kind of um, left to believe that, you know, everything which is strongly coupled cannot be solved exactly in the, in, in the sense that I'm going to present. Okay, so now, again, since my time is limited, I'll just jump straight to the point. So I will discuss only one particular measure of uh, uh, correlations in uh, uh, the quantum antibody systems on lattice. Uh, this is the so-called spectral form factor, which has been actually almost beaten to death for a single particle chaos. I mean, this is the, basically the most primitive correlation measure of spectral correlations. Uh, you start from a density of states or, 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 or I mean, uh, one point function, if you want, you build two point function out of it. That is the, 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 the pair correlation function. Uh, you integrate it over there. So now first, I'm probably I'm too fast a little bit, but still, I mean, what I will assume now is that uh, you uh, discuss Floquet dynamics. So the spectrum is not energy spectrum, but it's a quasi energy spectrum. Also, I will assume that there is a pure democracy in the spectrum. There is no preferential point. So the density of states on average is the same everywhere. That's assumption. And, uh, and then uh, you can define the two point function and you can average it over the quasi energy. So that's you, then you get this object, which I call R of theta. But then you do the Fourier transform of that. So this is the two point function. You're doing Fourier transform, then you get what people call a spectral form factor. And if you do these two line of calculations, you see that this can be actually just written as a double sum over all quasi energies which is weighted, I mean, exponentials of difference of quasi energy is weighted by T, where T is now an integer variable because phi is an unit circle. So this only makes sense if T is integer, and then this is exactly the Floquet time, that is the number of Floquet revolutions. And uh, if you just uh, go a little, one step further, you can write this as a trace of the U to the power T modulus squared. So if U is the many body propagator, so what you have to be able to compute is the trace of the many body propagator to some power, that is the propagator up to time zero to some time t. And the trace means that you basically start from a state, you end up in the same state. So it's a probability of amplitude that you arrive at the initial state and then you average other states. So that's basically what spectral compactor is. It's like an average of term probability or amplitude rather. And then of course there is this modulus square which makes this quantity a two point quantity. And uh, then you know, what, if you open a, uh, a, mono, a textbook on random matrix theory, then you learn that for random matrices or, or for even for dynamical systems, this quantity is not self-averaging. 
namely this doesn't make sense unless you introduce some sort of averaging, which I denote by this expectation value E. And this averaging means that you have to take either ensemble of uh, random matrices or ensemble of models where you tune some parameter. And usually this can be just a simple one parameter mod averaging, uh, even over a very small range of parameters. But you know, it's, it's something that you have to do in order to get a very fine quantity. And I will just show some example later on. <clears throat> and then, you know, we would like to compare to random matrices. So that's the idea of uh, quantum chaos is to compare statistics of dynamical systems, statistical measure, statistical properties of dynamical systems to properties of random matrices. Now in this case, dynamicals, dynamical properties. And uh, we have to learn then what random matrix theory teaches us. And for spectral form factor, there are exposed closed form results. For example, for the so-called, the, the, the corresponding ensembles of random matrices now are unitary matrices, the so-called Dyson circular ensembles. And uh, the two relevant ensembles that we have to consider are the unitary and orthogonal one, which are persistence with or without time or without or with time reversal symmetry. I will, I will not discuss any other ensembles in this talk. And uh, <clears throat> just you know, a brief sketch how this looks. I mean, the di main difference between COE and COE is the slope with which spectral form factor starts to grow, the so-called REM. I mean, the slope is one or two, depending on existence of non-existence or existence of time reversal symmetry. And then there is an additional, additional feature, which is usually, usually there for particular physical models, which is the time scale. I mean, one has to discuss, of course, the relevant time scales. There is one obvious time scale, which is given by the density of states or the number of levels in your many body Hilbert space, which is what I denote as curly M. And this sets a time integer T, which is equal to the, equal to the Hilbert space dimension, after which this spectral form factor has to beha behave like a sum of random numbers, which means it has to saturate and the, 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 the plateau it saturates on is the same as for random spectra. That is the same as, as for the so-called Poisson ensemble, which is something that you have to you know, use for let's say integrable systems. So there is this time scale after which you know, model dependent features go away. I mean, also the universality class dependent features go away. Uh, this is the Heisenberg time, and then there is the short time scale, which is usually referred to as the tallest time. And below this time scale, you will see really model dependent features. So there could be no universality up to, up to that time. And this, this time scale is usually associated with, I mean, persistence with conserved quantities. This is usually associated with diffusion. So that's, that's, that, 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 that's why it's usually referred to as the tallest time. In semi-classical models, in models with, 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 with classical limit, this is usually referred to as the Ehrenfest time and so on. Anyway, so there are these time scales and random matrix basically is the most prominent between these two times. And uh, then there is this uh, decades of history in quantum chaos of single particles from this famous Bohigas conjecture, which teaches us that uh, for models which have chaotic classical limit, one should expect that all spectral measures will be given, or at least in the proper scales, as I just commented, will be given by random matrix theory. I mean, I will not, I mean, so you have seen these pictures before. I mean, I will not comment on that at all. This is level spacings, level spacing distribution. These are examples of regular and chaotic systems like billiards, for example, of single particle. And then just to, 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 to finish the introduction, then there has been this uh, tour de force in the quantum chaos of single particle, which basically tried to derive spectral form factor from random matrix theory for chaotic dynamic systems. So, I mean, to, to, not from random matrix theory, from, from semi-classics, let's say, I mean, the key, uh, the key theory in semi-classic is the, the so-called Goodsfielder trace formula. So people have tried to use the semi-classical Goodsfielder trace formula to derive random matrix uh, spectral form factor. That in, I mean, in the 80s and beginning of 90s, I mean, this looked like an impossible problem. I mean, despite the fact that Barry has been able to, to compute the first term already in 85, but he used this very crude approximation. I mean, at least approximation which has to be somehow controlled and that time was impossible to control it. It's about diagonal approximation. So basically, this thing is already using goods with a trace formula. That is, you expand trace of u to the t in terms of classical periodic orbits using, let's say, your favorite stationary phase approximation, which works at small h bar. And then you do, since this is a two point quantity, you do double sum. And then you, you, you can somehow argue that only terms which remain after this double sum is this diagonal terms. And this diagonal terms gives you no oscillating, oscillating contributions. It's a purely sum of non-negative terms. And then there is a sum rule, which tells you that this is exactly equal to the time t or tau in this. Right? And then has been this uh, interesting, very interesting progress after 2000s, 
which kind of allowed one to actually express not only the first order, but all orders of spectral form factor and to show that this has been given by random matrix theory. I mean, I will not, I have obviously no time to go into that and it's not directly related to my talk, but it's just to tell you that for single particle problems, this has been kind of done, even though from mathematical physics perspective, this is not the proof, it's not the theory. I mean, it's still a kind of conjecture. Anyway, so but my talk is about single part, uh, many body problems at uh, h bar equal to one, that is at h bar, which is not a small number. So it's a non perturbative problem. You don't have a small parameter or a large parameter. So there is no way to expand or look at asymptotics in this small parameter. Uh, but what we want to see is uh, uh, how spectral form factor behaves for large systems. So that the small parameter, large parameter is a system size. And again, if you look at the literature in uh, non equilibrium, Dynamics of many body systems, you find, for example, in this previous paper by Marcus Rigor and Santos, you find this type of plots. I mean, people have, you know, uh, perturbed integrable systems, broken integrability, and what they find is the spectral statistics go from Poisson to random matrix. So the question is, why do you expect random matrix to hold at all? Because this model, this, these models are usually these are spin chains with local interactions. Um, yeah, it's like billiards, you know, where they have basically no randomness, but still. Uh, 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 for some reason, you get you get you get random matrix theory to hold. So I mean, it's kind of I would say, uh, yeah, at least to me, it was kind of a puzzle for, for for two decades. I mean, how many body systems with local interactions can at all have random matrix statistics? And uh, this is just to show you that this works. I mean, this is again from an old paper by uh, Carlos Pineda and myself, where we looked at the model that, that I will just tell you about later, this so-called kick teasing model. Uh, we looked at the spectral form factor in this model. This model has a time reversal symmetry. So this is what you get. I mean, I think black curve is the numerics and the red curve is random matrix theory. And uh, black lines are actually what you get if you don't do some sort of averaging. And here what the averaging we do is just the time averaging, moving time averaging. So no, no, no varying of parameters. This is a clean system. But you know, just if you don't do averaging to get this, this, this uh, scatter plot everywhere, but then if you do the moving time average, you get this kind of Smooth, smoothened curve, which goes very close to same to, to random matrix. Yeah. So this is just you know for typical parameters for which the model is non-integrable, you find that random matrix statistics works very well. And the question is why. And only quite recently there was a couple of papers uh, appearing uh, which kind of proposed the first mechanisms why uh, random matrix spectral statistics should apply in many body systems with 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 with, with, <coughs> with simple interactions. Let's say. I mean, there was a paper by, from our group, and there was a paper from the group of uh, John Chopper um, from Oxford, and uh, they considered two different situations. We looked at spin one half chains. They considered that uh, systems were again with a large number, a large parameter, uh, local hidden space dimension, but still no appearance in a classical limit. And uh, yeah, <clears throat> but anyway, so again, my talk is not about that. So finally, my talk is about systems with strictly local interactions and spin one half, so Q equal two. And uh, I start, I mean, I will give you just two kind of results. The first result is uh, on speaking, I mean, just flash through the result and try to stress the most important points. But uh, the, the, the system that we start working on uh, in this aspect was the kicked easing model. Uh, the mon problem model I kind of proposed to play, play with uh, well, yeah, 20 years ago or so. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's probably kind of the simplest model of spins one half with uh, log, log interactions. So we take a classic leasing model with some longitudinal fields. In this particular case, I would take fields which are actually random or at the position independent. And then there is a kick, uh, okay, kick. I mean, you take uh, a two, two, two step protocol in which the second step is, is, is the transfer speed. And then Flocky operator is such as a product of exponentials. And the problem is either uh, integrable or non-integrable, it's integrable when the field is transverse or longitudinal, but it's non-integrable when the field is tilted. <laughs> and uh, now just to, to show you how spectral form factor looks, I mean, this is if you do some primitive numerics with, for 15 spins, this is what you get. Of course, uh, this is for 15 spins, so uh, spe uh, Heisenberg time is two to the 15 in my units. So that's far away to the right. So what you see here is just a perfect linear ramp, it's like two. Now you get some small finite size effects at short times, but these are really finite size effects. It's not clear from this plot, but you know, because we can only do 15 sites, uh, there is lots of fluctuations at short times, but if you do larger system, the fluctuation gets smaller. And then moreover, what we do now is we do some averaging over a sample of systems, which is we take longitudinal field as a small parameter 
as, as, a, as, a, as a fluctuating parameter, which we sample as an IID variable from Gaussian distribution from, by vitamin H bar and some variant C bar. And then, and this is the key in this, in this, in this proof is to be, to be able to, to consider, I mean, to consider a, 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 an ensemble of systems which are disordered, but then uh, you can control the result as a function of the disorder uh, strength and uh, the average field. And uh, I will show you later that the results are actually robust against, uh, I mean, at least the limit of disorder strength going to zero exists. But of course, it's absolutely crucial to take the limit uh, very last. So it is about a slightly disordered system. Anyway, so that's the result that you can prove. Uh, and I'll show you in one or two slides uh, what is the main idea. But the result which we can actually prove is that the spectral form factor and thermodynamic limit, so we have to take thermodynamic limit first, uh, is equal to 2t if t is larger or equal to 7. Otherwise, there is some short time effects, which are actually not really crucial. But the point is that, you know, there is no time scale which would depend on system size for which, I mean, one would have to cross. So there is no tauless time which would depend on system size. But this then is, is, is kind of chaotic from time one or time a few onwards. <clears throat> and then for even t, and here one has to assume that down time is odd. So for even times, uh, we have only conjecture. We cannot really prove it. Uh, so, but still, I mean, as I show you later, we have much broader, much, much stronger results in a much broader class of systems for which, for which we can prove random matrix uh, spectral form factor. <laughs> anyway, so this result is, as I already stressed, it's independent of, 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 of the total strength. That means that at this particular model, and of course, I forgot to stress that this particular model means that also we have to choose the spin coupling and the transfer field to have a very special value, which is pi over four, which has to do with the duality, space-time duality symmetry, which I will stress later on. So in that particular uh, regime, there is no transition, no localization transition. I mean, we can show that there is, uh, since we show that there is spectral form factor, there could be no uh, <coughs> localization transition. <coughs> and more, and uh, moreover, result, result is independent of the value of the average value of the field. So we can take even the average value of the field to zero, which corresponds to transfer field. But since we take a slightly disordered system, we still get the same result. Okay, now how do we prove that? Maybe since I have, I really underestimated what 20 minutes mean. So, so rather than I was to, to show you how we prove that for transport physics model, I will just skip and I will just present a more general result. And then I will show you the key, the key idea of the proof there. So let me just select and flash through this. And uh, so, and I already mentioned that uh, the key here now is to take this trans, uh, kick this model at this particular value of the fields. Uh, and uh, so, coupling parameters, j equal to v equal to pi over 4. And that 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 uh, particular value of the fields is crucial because it makes problem self-dueling or dual unity, which is a more general property which, in, uh, which is required, uh, which I will explain in the next slide. But uh, I will just want to stress it here. I mean, this problem has been, this property has been first discovered in this particular model by the group of uh, Thomas Gore and has been used by us to, 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 be, to, to compute explicitly the factor form factor and it, at, that particular, at that particular point. Okay, but as I said, time is short, so I just go to a more general class of models, which includes uh, self tools, kick this model as a special case. And the key of this, of this feature here is what we call dual unitarity. And we will just, I will just discuss it in the, in the context of brickwork and flocky circuits. So let's just assume we have our, our, our two, two qubit gate. But now, since I will try to use a particular uh, diagrammatics in which space and time will be equally tr be treated symmetrically, I will plot these gates, uh, these wires, and the 45 degree angles. So now I will assume this that it is unitary when time goes vertically, but I also assume that it's unitary when time goes horizontally, which means it goes in the space direction. So I'll define a tilde operator, which uh, uh, maps a gate to a gate U tilde, which is just, just a flip uh, uh, of the indices. Uh, and I will require that U and U tilde are both unitary. And this is a kind of uh, definition of a sub-manifold of, 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 of uh, unitary group over this pair, uh, which is uh, composing this dual unitary gates. Then out of this, you can, you can, you can uh, make a, a circuit. And uh, <clears throat> this circuit, now you can read time-wise or space-wise. If you read it uh, time-wise, you can define it as, a, as, again, two layers in time. Even uh, even layer which is just tensor product of two gates, an odd layer which is just a shift. But then you can define a dual circuit, 
which goes space direction. And then it, obviously you have a duality of traces. And as you, as you have already seen, I mean, we actually we need to be able to compute traces. So this, this, this formula for duality of traces is kind of crucial. Okay, so now, uh, yeah, so how much I time I have? Probably I have to finish soon, right? Um, it's been already 20 minutes, so. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so, I mean, for example, I mean, in this slide, I just want yeah, to- Yeah, so you basically, you know, short for the question, but that's yeah, fine. If you have a few minutes, it's fine. Yeah, yeah, I think one, two, three minutes, I'll try to close. So, I mean, <clears throat> the point is now uh, just to convince you that, you know, uh, the class of the non-manifold of dual unitaries is actually not so small as you might think. I mean, it's fine-tuned, but it's not so terribly fine-tuned. It, it, it has just co-dimension two in the manifold of U4. That is for qubits. I mean, just ask this question for qubits because for higher dimensional qubits, is kind of a hard problem. But for qubits, we can answer this question. We would take a parameterization of SU4 or U4. And then you ask under what condition this is dual unitary, and you get that the only the only condition is that two, two parameters in the Heisenberg gate has to be pi over four, and these SU two gates, the local SU two gates, can be arbitrary. And this includes kind of uh, free gates, integrable gates, and also Kitesian gates. And there are various generalizations which I cannot really discuss. And now let me just in the last two minutes let me just go to our most general result. Now let's now assume that we take arbitrary dual unitary layer, I mean, brickwork, uh, brickwork circuit, which is composed of still a kind of clean, uh, that is times translation variant, that is uh, the same gate at every, every pair of sites, but you could take in principle different gates at different half, half time layers. So this light uh, red and dark red means that there are two, two different uh, dual unitary gates. And these bluish uh, circuits are single qubit gates, which are arbitrary as you I mean, they can be drawn from the, from some distribution, and this distribution could have some variance, and this variance could go to zero at the end of your calculation. That's the idea. Then again, you use this dual unitarity, which means you do basically what you do is you take two copies, uh, right? So spectral form factor is trace of you to the piece. It means that this has to be, and then it's a trace and it's periodic boundary conditions. So this is like a contraction of this tensor network on a torus, periodic boundaries in, in, in vertical direction, periodic boundaries in horizontal direction, and it's two copies. But now, since uh, this order is IID, the idea is that this order is independent random, you can average over this order if you do the space contraction rather than time contraction. In this way, you define the space transfer matrix, which is this vertical column. And this is what we denote as this WT. And now, now spectral form factor for given system size and given time is just trace of the T to the L. And now we do the thermodynamic limit, which means we just have to control the spectrum and the living eigenvectors or eigenvalues of the uh, living eigenvalue of this transfer matrix. In principle, what you can show is that there is uh, a gap between the eigenvalue one and the rest of the spectrum, and that the eigenvalue one is T4 degenerate. I mean, now this is the dual unitary circuit without special symmetries. So there is no time reversal here. So you expect unitary ensemble, which means you expect linear range with slope one. And that is equivalent to showing that this leading eigenvalue of this dual transfer matrix has uh, a multiplicity T. And again, I mean, I hope that I would have five minutes to explain the ideas around this, this tool, but I don't. So I, I'm, too, I'm very happy to discuss it in the question time, but, uh, but that, 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 that basically the idea of the proof is kind of in, in two steps. And the first step is basically to show that this leading eigenvalue, the problem of, 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 of the multiplicity of dual transfer matrix, this multiplicity can be mapped to a purely algebraic problem, which is counting the dimension of the some, some commutant of a set of operators that is, a set of operators which simultaneously commute with a specified set of operators. So this, this set of operators here are just magnetizations. So that, that is, this is just a magnetization on the arbitrary sublattice. There are two sublattices because this is, problem has a staggering. So there are two sublattices, even in odd sites. You've seen I denoted them by integer and half integer sites. So you basically define integer and half integer lattices, and then you define these two sub magnetizations. And then you get this magnetization coupling, coupled magnetizations, right? So the idea is to find a minimal set of operators and the spectral form factor is a commutant, uh, is the dimension of the commutant of the set. And this minimal set of operators are these two sets of organizations. And it's kind of obvious just by inspection that the set of operators which simultaneously commute with them is just translations. And since this is now, I forgot to stress, but this is now a spin chain of T sites because we went from time contraction to space contraction and the size of the system now is T. So there are spin chains of T sites so, so there is T operators, T translations, which simultaneously commute with the operators. Yeah. 
So that would be kind of showing the lower bound because the rest of the proof is to show that there are no other operators. But this is the maximal set. So once you've shown that, then you've shown that the spectral form factor is precisely true. So that is sort of in a, in a nutshell, in a, in a two minutes, the idea. But of course, there is uh, lots of technicality to fill in. But, but then, I mean, that is more or less what I wanted to say. So then, uh, the last slide, I just want to flash there has been a lot of activity in the, in, the, in the community in the last, let's say, last year or so. People were trying to use this space time duality also beyond dual unitary circuits. I mean, for example, there has been a paper from the Ken Choker group on relating uh, possible localization transition to, to eluding eigenvalues of dual transfer matrix. There has been papers around uh, with Pakemani and uh, Grover uh, on trying to, to uh, measurement uh, uh, phase transitions, monopoly phase transitions. Uh, um, again, one can have some interesting insight from looking at the dual unitary circuit, uh, space time dual circuits. And there has been, again, a, a few papers from the group of Dima Abani who looked into a particular the structure of this uh, eigenvectors of the dual transfer matrix uh, in the non dual unitary case. These are non trivial objects and uh, might have non trivial temporal entanglement, but in some cases, this entanglement can be under control and then can do a lot. I mean, you can say a lot about, about non trivial objects. So, with that, I'm sorry since I had to rush so fast that I really underestimate what 20 minutes mean. Uh, but still, I'm at the end. So, I had just one point in my talk, which is that uh, it's probably, I mean, um, just try to present this, this exciting results and possibility of exact control of perspective correlations in some, dual unit, some, some extended quantum lattice models. But of course, there is kind of a, a, a unfortunate, I mean, or uh, a point which I would not, I mean, I would like to put it under the Iraq, but I don't want, I, mean, I cannot. But that point would be, that, sorry. That point being that one has to take thermodynamic limit first in all these proofs, which means that what we can do is basically we can just, I mean, we cannot approach the Heisenberg time. We can only control the very short time. Uh, so, I mean, what one what, what would like to do, with what one would like to leave this constraint, this condition, one would like to, to also do the, let's say, uh, there is some noise. So there is, there is uh, uh, what one would like to do is what would like one would like to uh, control finite size effects. I mean, one would like to do the opposite order of limits. For example, if one wants to show statements like eigenstate harmonization, there one would have to take finite system size left time to infinity. So one has matrix elements, and then at the end do thermodynamic limit. So I mean that is completely out of reach at the moment, but uh, still uh, we have some preliminary numerics and heuristics. It shows that again, dual unitary circuit can be ideal uh, uh, models to, to, to show. It I mean, to be probably still simple, simpler than generic generic local circuits. Okay, sorry. With this, I would like to yeah. Sorry, I need to make an extension. I'd like to thank you and uh, I'll close my talk. <laughs> okay, so thank you, Tomas. Uh, there are maybe one or two minutes left for uh, for some for some questions. So please uh, raise your hand if you want to ask a question or unmute yourself and uh, go for it. Good, if there's no no direct question beginning, I would say that, uh, okay, Sebastian. A quick one, so, so I mean, <clears throat> so, uh, I was wondering what happens when you give up this this fine tuning. I mean, physically. I mean, when you do some numerics, is this smoothly connected then, or I the physics? I believe yes. I believe yes. That's actually very 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 interesting question, and that's the, basically the topic of that paper I quoted here, but I didn't have time to mention. That is a paper from our group in PRX in March or April this year, where we look precisely at this situation. I mean, what is we, we, we try to understand what happens if you shake it a little bit if you go away from dual unitary. Um, then, of course, you have to, to look at something something simpler than spectral form factor. We looked at just two point correlation functions of local observers. And mm -hmm. that, that, that seemed to be smooth in, in, in perturbation parameter. Mm -hmm. yeah, but. And the, the Clifford circuits, how do they relate to this dual unitaries? I mean, it's a, it's a, just if there's a simple, quick answer. Or... Well, I mean, this is certainly beyond Clifford circuits. I mean, these are. Uh, uh, that's, uh, 
Uh, these are also kind of, uh, as I understand, I mean, uh, fine-tuned instances of, of uh, models that, that I mean, thermalize. Yes. But Clifford are really not, I mean, Clifford circuits are really by no means structurally stable. I mean, they're very special, right? So if you go slightly away, then it's going to be different. Yeah. yeah. So I think it's, I mean, yeah. It, it, I think it includes some Clifford circuits, but, you know, it's, for example, it includes even swap gates and uh, integrable gates and so on. But, but the generic dual unitary is much, uh, is much richer than that. So much more than that. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, there is one more quick question. Otherwise, I would like to maybe, uh, you can also start Frank already to, to start uh, his. Uh... I've got a question here uh, from KITP. This is. Okay, yes. So actually, Sebastian asked my first question, but my second question is for these dual unitaries. Is there a higher dimensional generalization of that? Like you have one space dimension and one time dimension. Is there some analog when you have, say, two space dimensions and one time dimension? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that there is. I mean, uh, it's quite straightforward. I mean, some context. In some context, this has been discussed in one of the recent papers by Vedika, I think. But I mean, that's. I mean, I think maybe we mentioned also somewhere. But yeah, it's. You can you can make, for example, this kick teasing model in higher D plus one dimensions, and you can uh, find. Uh, and you can. I mean, it's almost straightforward to repeat all the analysis in, in D plus one. So I mean, of course, the the, the problem becomes even more constrained. Uh, I mean, it becomes, for example, I didn't have time to, to, to discuss correlation functions, but this correlation, I mean, these models correlation functions are confined to a, to a light race, which, 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 I mean, the, the non-zero correlations are only at light rays, which move at speed plus minus one. Now, in these plus one dimensions, these are the edges of the pyramid, I mean, they're not even the cone. So it's, it's quite kind of, quite. Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so 